All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Science Off Tap, Changes on the Horizon. This is part two in our fall series. Um, and today we're gonna be talking all about CSA wildlife or wildlife forensics. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, we have those of us joining via Zoom and also hello to those joining via our Facebook Live. Um, if you want to ask questions at any point during the presentation, you can type them in Zoom in the chat or on Facebook under the comments on Facebook and we'll be monitoring both of those uh, to ask to our presenter at the end of the presentation. But you can type your questions at any time. Hi everyone, um, and my name is Chelsea and I'm a museum educator at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to thank some of our partners in this event, um, Cypress and Gro Grove Brewing Company and First Magnitude Brewing Company. Um, typically these events were held um, live at those breweries. So we just wanna thank them for continuing to support us um, in these programs. Our next Science Off Tap um, will actually be November 12th at 7 p.m. Um, and this one will be our last of the fall series. Um, and it'll be called Mangroves on the Move with Julie Walker. So make sure you have that one on your calendar. It's gonna be really fun. Um, and thanks, Chelsea. I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Sadie Mills with the Thompson Earth Systems Institute. And I wanted to quickly share a campaign that uh, the Thompson Earth Systems Institute or TESI has going. Um, insects in decline worldwide, but there are lots of ways you can help to learn more about how to protect the insects and take a pledge to help them out. You can visit our website at bit.ly slash insect effect. And we'll also drop that in the chat. Another event I wanted to make sure you guys all had your calendar um, is the Florida Springs film series. Um, this will be on November 8th at 7 p.m. That's when we'll be doing a panel discussion. Um, and this event is going to have Springs experts from all over Alachua County um, discussing the film um, Lost Springs. Um, you'll be able to actually stream the film on your own time um, starting November 5th on our YouTube page. Um, and we'll go ahead and post the link to um, how to sign up for that now. So the registration is open if you're interested in signing up. Um, one more thing before we really get started um, with all of these events and all the events at the museum, um, we like to send out surveys at the end of the program. Um, and this is just so we can hear from all of you. Um, we're really interested in learning what you think of our programming, how we can improve, what topics you're interested in learning about, um, things like that. So at the end of the program, we'll post a survey link in the chat. Um, it will also appear in your email inbox um, at some point tomorrow afternoon. So if you miss it in the chat, um, you'll have a second chance there. Um, so please take just a few minutes to help fill out those surveys. Thank you. All right. And finally, if you've been to one of these before, you know that we like to provide an opportunity to interact with the presentation. Uh, we do that using a tool called Mentimeter, which you can access using another tab on your computer or with your mobile browser on your smartphone. So to play along, all you need to do is in one of those browsers, go to www.menti.com and then type in the following code, 152847. Now I'm going to give you a few seconds to navigate there, but if you don't get there in time, you'll notice that the website and code are in the chat and anytime that there is a quiz question, the website and the code will be at the top of the page. So you'll never, um, never miss out on it. So to give us a chance uh, to test this out before we jump right into the questions, um, we thought we'd do a little warm up and because Halloween is coming soon, we thought we give you a chance to decide between some really adorable, adorable animals and costumes and decide which one is best. So using your Mentimeter, who wore it best? The lizard shark or the duck bee? Go ahead and vote now. Looks like votes are coming in slowly. Mm -hmm. 
I bet there's more. I'm going to go ahead and refresh and see if, oh, there we go. All right, thank goodness we're showing some love for the duck there. I thought uh, the buzz on that guy was pretty cool. But you're right, the shark is a fantastic costume for a lizard. All right, well, I think we've got the hang of how this Mentimeter works. Um, so just keep that handy because there'll be plenty of opportunities uh, to use that throughout the program. So with that, I wanna introduce tonight's speaker. Madeline Verbeek is a master's student at the University of Florida studying wildlife forensics and conservation. Her work involves the understanding of wildlife crime with the use of molecular biology. In the future, Madeline hopes to be able to combine her passion of applied conservation genetics with museum collections to better understand the historical implications of wildlife crime. We're so excited to have her tonight. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker. Wonderful, thank you all. All right. Let me share my screen here. There we go. Everyone see that hopefully? <laughs> all right. So I, I just, I want to thank you all for coming out and hanging out with me tonight. And uh, well, let's get started. So just as a brief content warning before we start, I'm going to have Frank talk of death. I'm also going to have pictures of dead wildlife. And today I am not giving any legal advice. So who exactly am I and why am I talking to you all today? So I grew up on a gentleman's farm here in Plant City. It's actually where I'm currently at. And uh, this is a farm that produces enough food for a community, a small community or a household. I also, well, I, I love to craft. So I, I made a little crochet, a uh, little bee here, but I also want to say that uh, I, I have some other odd craft choices as well. Things like taxidermy, uh, skeletal articulation. I'm learning a handful of languages and I've had a couple of weird jobs here. So you can see I've been a beekeeper, studied sharks, all that good stuff. Now I want to tell you all about why I am a scientist. I am a scientist to, well, I, I'm creative. I'm able to explore the world, explore a little bit of everything. Now, sadly, before we get started, I'm actually going to pause and kind of redo my PowerPoint here because it seems like my photos are having some trouble loading. So I'm just going to really quickly here, let me see if I can undo this just for a moment. And I'm going to bring this back up. I apologize for that. So while we're waiting, let me also kind of start going into this. You see, I'm going to review four main things tonight. The first one is I'm going to introduce to you all exactly what wildlife forensics is. Next, I'm going to go into kind of the, the reason why it isn't great, or at least the reason why some of my work isn't all uh, that easy to handle. So let me, let me hop on over here and I'll share my screen again and let's try this again. All right. Hopefully, you all can see this. Aha! Excellent, much better. So I'm going to show you some uh, Florida-specific concerns. I'm going to go into why this is an actual issue. And then hopefully at the end, I'll show you, uh, well, why you should care. So what exactly is wildlife forensics? It seems complicated, right? So here, let me give you our first Mentimeter of the night. And it seems like some people are already jumping in. This is awesome. So what are some of the words that you think of when you hear the words wildlife crime or wildlife forensics? I already see some excellent answers. Yes, poaching, rhinoceros, bugs. Oh, I'm so excited. Someone said bugs, yes. Excellent. Elephants, yeah. 
exotic animals. Oh, some great answers are coming in. Ooh, I like habitat destruction as well. Someone's thinking of plants. Excellent. So let me give you a definition of wildlife forensics because there's, there's a lot that goes into it. So the very easy definition is that it is the application of science to legal cases involving wildlife. And this is investigating wildlife crimes and, and it can involve the exotic pet trade, poaching, illegal hunting, even oil spills. We analyze wildlife parts, pieces and products to figure out what exactly happened with that piece of wildlife. It's pretty much the same as human forensics, except it's every other animal and plant not involving humans. So we attempt to identify the evidence and then we attempt to link the suspect, the victim and the crime all together. We're building a big picture. We'll, we're making a, a large puzzle. Now, the problem is that unlike human stuff, legality is a little bit different for us. It depends on the species, the locations, the, the weapon that was used this can be a little bit complicated. So let me show you a black and white case first. So my black and white case is African elephant potion. So previously tusks that they're modified growing incisors and they could weigh up to 200 pounds each, especially with these super tuskers that you can see on the lower left hand side there. Now they have been used for centuries, things like manufacturing false teeth, yeah. Between 1979 and 1987, poaching for all African elephant species and subspecies reduced the population from 1.3 million down to 600,000. Back in 1990, there was a little bit more legislation that was passed and sadly though, back in 2016, this is the last time that we've had a verified population estimation and it's around 400,000. So this is black and white. We know that this is a problem. Some non-black and white though cases are cases that involve uh, things being grandfathered in. So let's say you have a family member who passes down this polar bear skin rug and you find a tag on it that says 1955, but you know that owning a polar bear is illegal. So you bring this to, let's say a wildlife officer. This wildlife officer is going to start piecing together some different information. They're going to look at what the animal is. It's a polar bear, we know that. They're gonna look at the age of how long this rug has been around, this object has been around. 1955, okay. And then we're gonna look at the location. Chances are that polar bear did not come from Florida. Chances are it came from up north. Because this animal was uh, turned into a rug before the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which is an act that protects marine mammals, which was enacted in 1972, this rug is grandfathered in. So it is okay to own. Now, another Mentimeter question here, is this purse right here, a crocodile, an alligator, or a snake, or something else? Alligator, all right, all right. Other, excellent. No love for the snake, I didn't, didn't trick anybody with the snake. Excellent. All right. So before I tell you all what exactly it is, I'm going to tell you why it's hard to identify. So it's illegal to have any crocodile species here in America. We have the American crocodile and it is highly endangered. So it's illegal to hunt at any point in time. An alligator, however, those are legal to have under certain permits. The problem though is looking from the outside, they look like 
lizard like shaped long toothy snouts and they hang out in the same location and they look nearly identical. So when I found this purse, I originally found the posting online from a retail location. And this location said that it was real alligator, but where did it come from? Did it come from a raised location or was it captured? Was it captured under proper permits? Now, what if I tell you that when I reversed the photograph and looked up the image in Google, I found the same purse in multiple different locations that had different tags on it. So now what are you thinking? Can you really trust what they say? So let's go into three really, really quick examples of wildlife crime in your own backyard. The first one, too many turtles. October 2019, we had two suspects that were, well, they were ended up being charged for poaching of native turtles and selling them overseas. Now they were found for a couple of different reasons and the turtle poaching was kind of tagged in at the very end of their charges. Now FWC had been following them for nearly a year and in the six month period from the time that they were arrested to six months prior to that, these two people, they sold off over 4,000 turtles. These turtles can be sold upwards of 300 each and retailed at 10,000. This is not sustainable. So we do have reptile farms here in Florida and it is legal to have these farms. The downside is you have to hit a certain quota in order to ship these animals off. That quota means that likely these people are going to go out and try to find these animals elsewhere. So you can see here some of the locations that they were shipping from and shipping to. So from Miami, it was shipping off to China. From Miami as well, it's Los Angeles. They had no idea where this one was going to from to Atlanta. Now, I wanna emphasize that legal and illegal businesses can run in tandem. And that's part of the reason why it's so hard to find wildlife crime. So another one, we got palmetto berry harvesters. This palmetto berry is an excellent food source right now, right before winter for animals like bears. So they need that in order to fatten up and get uh, ready for winter. These berries, when you smash them up, they can turn into medical benefits and anything that you can think of will fixed, not so much. There were in 2019, 8 million pounds of berries that were harvested and found. And this is upwards of tens of millions of dollars. Next up, flying squirrel. And if you were anything like me, I had no idea these were around, that these were a thing. So you can trap them in sort of kind of little bat houses. You just put a plug on it and you can ship them off. So here we have an example of something, this case was called the Knox Farm. So here we have the squirrels being trapped in Florida, shipped off to Georgia, being driven up to <laughs> Illinois, a couple, yeah, a couple of hours, and then eventually shipped to South Korea where they're sold for the pet trade. Now, I wanna know from you all, for this pet trade, in 2019, how much money do you think one flying squirrel cost you? How much money? And this is not prices right rules. You can pick the, uh, the closest possible. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm seeing a trend here. All right, so I'm gonna end us there but I see us on the higher spectrum. So it's about 50 bucks. You might think that's nothing. Like, why, why am I bringing this up? These animals and plants and objects are, they're captured in the thousands and in the tons. This is causing regional extinctions, if not global extinctions. And this is happening in your own backyard. 
So why do people do this? There are a couple of different reasons why. Sometimes it's because the community needs the resource. One elephant can provide a month's worth of food and a year's worth of salaries for a community and they have no other resources. Another thing is that it could be cultural based. Indigenous people of Americas have been working with the land and working with these wildlife for, for generations without exploitation. This is not at all a crime. Next up, some people are just unaware of this and, and unaware that it's a crime. And we're gonna play a game next to see what we might have inside our own house. And finally, there's malice involved. It's easy money with easy penalties. At max, people here in Florida with a misdemeanor for wildlife crime, they get $500. The Knox Farm, the squirrel dealers, they're still waiting to, to be, uh, well, in trial. So let's play a game. Whether or not you are aware that you might have some objects in your house that could be illegal. So again, I'm, uh, remember, I'm not giving any legal advice. So first thing, I want you to look around and see if you have any pictures of nature, photos of nature. Now look around, see if you have any shells, feathers, skulls, rocks. Insects, fur, jewelry, furniture. And lastly, I want you to think of what you are watching on television. So Tiger King, a brief introduction, featured a big cat breeder who was sentenced to 22 years in federal prison. 18 years for a murder plot, 14 years for an Endangered Species Act violation. They are both running concurrently though. So that means that the Endangered Species Act violation is nearly negligible. Netflix could have made a larger impact on the people who were viewing it and they decided to gloss over it. The media that you watch is important. So depending on how you find these objects and how you collect them will make the, the legality, whether or not it's legal or not. And remember, even if it is legal, is it ethical? This is up for you to decide. So were some of you surprised about the numbers of objects that you might have inside your house that could be illegal to have? Maybe. So why should you care at all about this? How much money do you think wildlife crime is worth? And this is not a Mentimeter question. Just think about it for a moment. And I have a pangolin here. This is the, uh, the most trafficked animal currently here on, on Earth. Well, it's the fourth largest crime in the world and it ranges from five to $30 billion a year. Why this range? It seems pretty big, right? Well, it's because this crime is connected to all of the other major crimes. So the top three, and they swap out each year, but the top three is humans, guns, and drug trafficking. So these objects, <laughs> they're, they're easy money. They're shipped out with all of these other trafficked items. And if we find them, it doesn't mean that we have a cold cut case. This is Singapore's second largest collection of pangolin scales and it was around 12 tons. Again, second largest. So this is a problem on multiple different levels. We are impacting species, but we're also impacting animals that are not necessarily being hunted directly. So let, let me explain this. We have biosecurity, biomedical, and invasive species risks. So if you're here from Florida, you might recognize this little guy here, the, uh, the Cuban tree frog. And I, I want you all to look closely because here, this is a store in the UK where you can buy one as a pet. Prop. Here we, we have a bear who is uh, 
going at it <laughs> into a trash can. The problem here is that if a bear comes into a human community, it loses some of its, its uh, protection. So changing behaviors removes protections. And finally, we have genetic diversity loss happening. This is an adult male bighorn sheep. And you can see the reduced horn size. It's not at all what we uh, kind of envision and what we see in children's textbooks and, and children's magazines. Their horns are being reduced because they are being caught by trophy hunters. Not all hunting is bad. Trophy hunting, just to take an animal that's the biggest and the best, is. Plants face the same concerns. And this is why I have emphasized wildlife the entire time. Plants give us so much and people glaze over them. And it's understandable, they don't actually realize it, but it's important. There are nearly 15,000 species that are, are threatened. And this is 20% of all plants that are at risk. These plants do a lot for us. And if you don't like eating them, hopefully you like looking at them. Finally, if you don't care about anything else, care about the fact that species are going extinct, plain and simple. So what's being done to fight this? Anybody get the joke? Rolling Stones, doom and gloom. I thought it was funny. So Florida Fish and Wildlife here is doing a ton of work. You see, Florida Fish and Wildlife controls a massive amount of area, a massive amount of space, and a massive amount of animals. And they, well, they're one of the only locations here in the United States that has a dedicated wildlife forensic unit that's actually being created at the University of Florida. All right, our next Mentimeter question. So with no other information, is this elephant poached? Um, maybe, I like it, I like it. All right, so let me see if I can get this to work. If not, we might have to skip it, sadly. It's, aha. So our elephant here is a replica, and it is actually a bar. Other ways of fighting wildlife crime is being creative. So we have replica taxidermy coming out so that you don't have to go out and get animals, trophy animals that are being reduced in the wild. There's also other ways you can 3D print out bones if you would like. If you're interested and if you can work and become engaged in various levels of government and advocate for environmental change, as well as many other critical global needs. When you're traveling, try not to buy any sort of wildlife object that is not sustainably harvested. You can also buy objects like these butterflies that are also replicas. You don't just have to go for the large animals. When you're in very specific locations that you're traveling to, try not to engage with the wildlife unless it is ethical. You do not need to ride an elephant in Thailand in order to have a connection with these animals. If you go to sanctuaries or places where retired elephants go, you can still have that bond with them and they're allowed to do their thing. I know it seems down. I know it seems like my work is sad, but it's not because we're making an impact. We're making a difference. 
with our work, with our collaboration, our innovation, our communication, we're bringing species back from the brink of extinction. We're bringing back whales that have been nearly hunted to nothing. We're, we're bringing them back in larger and larger numbers. We're also bringing back animals that seem really close to us, like a gorilla. When you look in their eyes, we're, we really are making a difference. So the last Mentimeter question of the night is fighting wildlife crime a hopeless endeavor? <laughs> Yay, <laughs> absolutely not. There's a no, I get it, I get it. <laughs> Excellent. So I'm very glad that we got an opportunity to talk about my work, talk about the various ways that you can expand and you can do and, and help these species. If you want to learn more about some of the the various things that I cited here, the, the various um, ways that you can get involved, check out any of these links. And I believe we're gonna put them in the chat or have them connected somehow. You'll be able to find them. Finally, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, give a quick <laughs> information and photo credit. Uh, thank you for all of them. Uh, as well as a special thanks to, uh, well, Chelsea, Sadie and Rebecca for dealing with me for the past couple of months, uh, for Dr. Bruce McFadden for allowing me into the Broader Impacts course, which has, um, it's definitely made myself a better presenter and hopefully make a connection with you all, as well as uh, friends and family who have also had to deal with me practicing this for the past week, nearly nonstop. All right. Uh, couple of my my favorite female biologists and conservationists here as we wrap up. Excellent. Thank you, Maddie. That was awesome. My pleasure. I, I know that it was a little bit fast, but I wanted to make sure that we get all of that information in. Yeah, we got we we got it all in and we have some questions too. And I want to remind all of our viewers at home that this is a great time to go ahead and add some questions to the chat there. Um, there's a few of us keeping our eyes on it. Um, and Sadie and I will be here to address those questions. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with the first question that I saw come in um, from Susie asking, um, from your turtle slide, Maddie, the one with too many turtles. Um, do you know what species those are by any chance? I do. Do you mind if I go back to sharing really quickly? Yeah, go for it. Just because I have it on the slide and I'm not able to actually see it. Oh, actually, I don't have to share it. Haha. -ha. Um, okay, so it was Florida box turtle, Eastern box turtle, striped mud turtle, Florida mud turtle, chicken turtle, Florida soft shell, Gulf, Gulf Coast spiny soft shell, spotted turtles, diamondback terrapin. They were also found with a Kemp's Ridley skull and carapace, uh, the shell, as well as black bear parts. Uh, and black bears are trafficked here for their gallbladders um, and for various other pieces like claws. So overall, they they had a lot of different animals that they were trafficking. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty wild. <laughs> it's a lot of different types of turtles for sure. And this is a secondary charge. They were found for other charges first. So, yeah. Wild. Um, Sadie, do you want to ask the next question? Yeah, so our next question has to do with the game and wondering about um, photos of wildlife and what would make those illegal. So I brought up the photos just to kind of, well, two reasons. First reason is to temper you all to start looking around the room and start thinking of some of the objects that you might have that are nature related. So it, it was kind of to, to get you thinking. The second thing is 
depending on what is happening inside the photo, it could be illegal. So things like if you are petting a wild tiger, bad. Uh, things like if, if you have a puffer fish, and if the puffer fish is inflated, it is very difficult on these fish to be inflated and then deflate. It, it's a last resort mechanism. So if you have a picture with this animal, it is, it's hard on the animal so we can look poorly. It's not illegal, but it's something that could be bad. So two different reasons. Again, mostly getting you thinking about it. Awesome, we got a make sense, thanks. Yay. <laughs> um, Maddie, um, one of our viewers from Facebook is asking, um, how closely does wildlife forensics work with law enforcement? Excellent question. So there's a couple of different layers. We have forensics, kind of officers that are also wildlife officers. So we have that connection. So FWC, those are wildlife officers, and then they have their own forensic unit. But then on the opposite side, let's say a sheriff, a, a human officer <laughs> comes across a scene, uh, comes across something and they find bones or maybe they find something, uh, let's say, they find seeds on the shoe sole and they have no idea what these seeds are. Well, they can send those seeds to a forensic person, a wildlife forensic person, and we can help identify those seeds. So let's say we find these seeds and they come, up, come from a completely different location, an entirely different state. Now we know either those shoes were in those states or the person was. So there's a couple of different collaborations that we have. Thanks, Maddie. Absolutely. That's, that's a really good answer. That helps us a lot. Um, yeah, we wear a lot of different hats. <laughs> yeah, there's so many different facets of wildlife forensics for us to learn about. Um, so this question um, is asking about recommendations. Um, so do you have any recommendations for how to identify um, ethical objects for sale or even um, when traveling, how to know which organizations are ones that you should maybe um, support or not support? Great question. And sadly, it's a complicated answer. If it's here in Florida or the United States, you can look up some of the, the laws, legislations, and policies with your local wildlife officials. So the Florida Fish and Wildlife uh, Conservation Commission, sadly, I forgot to introduce that earlier. That's the FWC people. Uh, they have various policies and laws on their website. And you can also call them to get a, a quicker response. And that will go into what's legal here in Florida and here in the United States. Florida rules are different compared to each state. Each state has their own laws. It's also sometimes illegal to bring an object that was legal in one state into another. You can find all of that on Florida Fish and Wildlife's website. When it comes down to other locations, it's, it can be impossible. Keep an eye out for some of the objects, things like the, the bracelets, the turtle bracelets. If they look sadly too good to be true, I would say look it over again, think it over again. You might be able to uh, see online whether or not this location is well known. You might be able to go to various representatives that are there physically. I would just say be more conscious and aware and maybe buy it here in the US instead of overseas. All right, so um, we've got another question. Um, this person says, I work in an industry in which a tenfold increase in fines per incident in Florida um, per Florida regulations has significantly increased compliance with those regulations. So 
what is limiting the ability of FWC to levy fines to discourage illegal collecting? Whew. Great, great question. Couple of things. Just so connecting a human crime to a human perpetrator is easier than connecting a wildlife crime to a, a human perpetrator. And that's because some of the, the things that I explained before, it depends on the timing, it depends on the species, it depends on a lot. Another thing is that our policies just have not caught up. Wildlife crime has only recently been taken, for lack of better words, seriously. Sadly, in other locations, sometimes here in the United States, but other countries, wildlife crime is something that the country, the government doesn't care about. Not saying that they're not caring for malice, they, they just prioritize other things. Some countries follow other countries. It, it's a couple of layers, it's a couple of different folds hopefully with more people caring, hopefully with more people being aware and the science catching up with human science will start making strides. Our, most of our science, like the genetics that we use, it's all based off of human work. We're still trying to figure out how to pull fingerprints off of scales. It's fingerprints were done a hundred years ago. So we're slowly but surely catching up. But until then, it's it's not the the courts are not going to take it as seriously thanks maddie yeah. um so this question kind of goes back to something you touched on a little bit so hopefully you can tell us some more um so the alligator farms that are kind of around the state i know there's one in st augustine maybe orlando um our viewers saying they always thought of these as more of an educational type of experience um, but then sometimes you'll see jaws or claws in the gift shop. Is that regulated? Um, do you know anything about that kind of stuff? Great, great question. So remember, it's legal for these locations to have a specific amount of animals. So think of it like backyard chickens. So you can, in Sarasota, you can have upwards, I believe, of four backyard chickens, uh, but you can only have hens. You cannot have a rooster. The same with these alligator farms. They can have so many alligators of so many certain sizes. So everything from eggs to hatchlings to adults. That is all regulated. They have to be within a certain location, a certain size of the habitat that they're in, entirely legal. And they, much like your backyard chicken, they can do anything that they really want with them. So they can get those little claw back scratchers. They can make the, the uh, jaws legal. The illegal part of it comes in when they're taking from the wild or if they're abusing the animal. That's where it gets illegal. If it's in the gift shop, and the location is a location that is reputable, that has a, it has a plaque, it has a certificate that says that it is a alligator farm certified by FWC, you're good to go. Great, thank you. Um, could you tell us some of the species in Florida that are at the highest risk of being poached? Oh, highest risk. Reptiles are definitely, definitely high on the list. And it might seem silly just because they're, they're like everywhere. You can find a gator in like a pond in the middle of a, a community, but reptiles are heavily, heavily poached. Birds here, migratory birds are also trafficked here. So when birds go you know what migratory is when they come up and down, depending on the season, they are captured here, especially songbirds. Songbirds are captured and then they're sent around the world for buyers and for people who want them as pets. When it comes down to mammals, sugar gliders are up there. 
bears are up there for their their gallbladders. As of right now, let's stick with with those two mammals and plants. Palmetto berry is, is up there as well. Ah, oh, yes, I see in the chat, native orchids. How could I have forgotten? Yes, uh, the orchid thief. Excellent, thank you, uh, Ellen, I, I appreciate that. Yes, the orchid thief. If, if chances are you read the book as a kid. Um, yeah, there's orchids that live in South Florida that have previously been uh, heavily poached they're beautiful. Um, now they're they're regulated in locations that are hard to get to. Um, but yes, that's an excellent, excellent example of a plant. Totally forgot about it. That's great. I'm glad. I'm glad we have some helpers in the audience too. That's that's awesome. <laughs> um, so someone is asking if you have ever testified in a famous forensics case yet. <laughs> oh, sadly not yet. So part of me being a part of the master's program sets me up to be able to talk and be able to be an expert witness in cases. It can be difficult to become an expert witness unless you have enough of a background for it. You have to have so many years of experience, maybe so many years of uh, education. So after this, if I'm able to uh, get a job uh, location uh, to be able to work in wildlife forensics, hopefully then I'll be able to come back in 10 years and tell you yes. All right, so our next question, um, we've been talking a lot about things on land, but our question's about the sea. What about deep sea fishing? Is it regulated and who enforces it? Ooh, deep sea fishing. A, how far are you off from the coast of Florida and off the coast in general? That changes some legal rules. Technically, when you bring them back into Florida, waters technically comes back into Florida laws, but that's one thing to think about. The other thing is fishing here in Florida is regulated by FWC. So that Florida Fish and Wildlife, they're the ones who go out onto your boat and make sure that you're wearing the life vests as well. So they do anything that's out on the water. Sometimes the sheriff can become involved. Sometimes there's, there's human uh, officers that can become involved in it, but primarily it's FWC. And they, again, have all of those laws and legislations on their website. Thanks, Maddie. Um, the next question is about um, invasive species. So um, what is what happens with um, with those? Are we are we allowed to kill the big invasive grasshoppers and Cuban tree frogs? Do you know any more information about that? So that goes into that legal versus ethical part again. Some species are what, what we call kill on site. However, there are specific ways that they are supposed to be killed. Just because an animal is invasive does not mean that you can abuse it in, in any capacity. So there are various ways that you can work with these animals in order to eradicate them, work with these plants as well. I would suggest, again, to go to FWC's website. They'll be able to, to talk you through some of these things. I know that I have skunk weed growing all over my backyard Technically, you can take those down, but you want to be careful that you're not damaging some species that are, are local here. If you're questioning it at all, if you ever see a species and you don't know 100% that it's invasive or problematic, don't touch it. Don't interact with it. The python problem down south, that's something else. Uh, same with hogs. If you really want to go out there, really want to start making a difference, you can sign up for a hog permit and a python permit. And you can go out there and legally uh, work on these invasive species. And sometimes you can get paid for that. 
Thank you. So um, is there a wildlife crime in Florida that seems to be more prominent than others or more on the rise? Great question. Um, as far as I know, and this might also sound doom and gloom, but everything is going up on the rise a lot. Um, right now, I cannot think of anything that is growing and becoming more of a problem. In fact, actually, you know, I, I, take, I take my previous statement back. The more that we talk about this and the more that we are engaging and working with communities and educating ourselves and others, the better this problem will become and the more solutions that will come out of it. So hopefully these species after this talk and you all go back and you start talking to your community, hopefully people will start being more aware of it and we'll have declines. Thanks, Maddie. Um, I have another question. Um, so does it matter if you find, say, a skull um, in a state park versus in your backyard? Does it make a difference um, location wise if you find one of these objects on your own? Good question. Inside of a state park, there are definitely laws that will keep these objects there. The rule is take, take nothing. In fact, take stuff out if you can in terms of trash and garbage. Uh, leave only footprints though, or leave only bubbles if you're underwater. In your own backyard, it depends on the species. If you find a raccoon, a possum, technically you need a trapper's license for them. So those would be legal if you have the license for it. And I, I believe it's something like $20 or $15 for a trapper's license for the year. Uh, an eagle skull, never. Um, a cougar skull, never. On public lands, on private lands. Those are protected species. So if the species is protected, you may not interact with it anywhere in your own backyard or anywhere else. All right, so we had another question asking if you're familiar with a website, um, thearticulatereptile.com. Oh no, that sounds fun. <laughs> well, uh, we'll make sure you have the website so you can check it out later. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to Facebook in a little bit and be like, yeah, or that, that sounds good. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I'm looking forward to learning more about it. And um, I think this might be our last question for now, unless anyone has any last minute ones come in. Um, but what's the deal with feathers? Can I pick them up off the ground? Um, I read The Feather Thief, so I know a little bit about that, but I'm not sure if our audience does. So feathers are covered by the Migratory Bird Act of 1992, I believe. Um, so any animal, any bird that migrates, it is illegal to possess that feather. It is legal to possess feathers of birds that you had permits to hunt for, things like turkey. That's legal to have. However, you have to have the tag associated with your, your permit. Anything like eagle, owl, no. There is one endemic species here in Florida that is not considered migratory, but sadly, it is endangered. It's actually critically endangered, and that's the Florida scrub jay. So if you find their feathers, you have to be in a very specific location to find them in Oscar Shear National Park. So first of all, it's a state park, um, so no go. And then second of all, because it's a critically endangered species, you can't possess it. So I believe turkey is probably the only one that you could have as long as you have that tag. Does that include peacock feathers as well? I know a lot of times people use those for decor. Great question. Um, they, they might be considered a nuisance species, so that might be legal. I will default to 
find a local Florida Fiction Wildlife Officer, give that hotline a call or look it up online uh, in order to figure that out. And next time when I give uh, this talk, I will Google that beforehand and I'll know. I believe they're a nuisance species. Uh, so yes, it would be legal, but don't quote me. All right, well, I think we have uh, a fun question to wrap up the night. Where can I find that fantastic elephant bar? So the name is, so these, these folks do some pretty cool taxidermy. Um, if you want to type this out into the chat, it is K-A-N-A-T-I. K-A-N-A-T-I, taxidermy. So they do a lot of replicas. They do still do wild caught animals. They are a taxidermy service. And I'm not plugging them whatsoever. Um, I have no association to them, uh, but I found it a very unique, uh, K yes, you got it. Um, <laughs> I found it a very unique replica to show that it looks like an elephant. It is not an elephant though, and it actually doubles as something else. So we're, we're getting creative. All right, well, Maddie, I wanna thank you so much for uh, spending the evening with us. Um, we really enjoyed that. And to our audience as well, thank you um, for spending your time with us. And we hope to see you at our next Science Off Tap. Um, as Chelsea mentioned earlier, we'll be dropping a survey link in the chat. Um, if you don't mind taking it and let us know what you thought about tonight. And then you'll also get an email if you registered via the Eventbrite. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you.